about contouring for GYN cancers or basically cervical cancers for the brachytherapy. So we're going to start off with a small little lecture on film base, and then I'm going to show you how I contour on the CT. I am going to look at the chat, but please, if you guys have questions while I'm contouring, ask them because I'd rather you just ask while I'm contouring because I do better with people talking to me than me talking to myself. Okay, so. If you have questions while I'm contouring or while I'm saying anything, please just interrupt. So we're going to start off with just, and I see if I can get which screen I want. Okay, so we're going to start start off with, and can you see my screen now? Yes. yes. Okay, so we're going to start off with film base because I know that's what we I was asked to talk a little bit about. As you all know, we are moving away from film base, but I know a lot of people still do film, film base, especially in Africa, because it's low resource and easy to do. So just real quickly on film base. So film base. So you take an AP and a PA film and you're going to look at points, right? So you look at point A, point B, bladder and rectum. And I'm just going to go over this a little bit, like I said, because we do need to talk about this because I think a lot of you guys are still doing this. But what is point A? Point A is where the uterine artery crosses the ureter, right? So it's basically your pyramid dose. So this is actually a real relevant dose. It was really based on anatomical landmarks, right? So the way, how do you define what point A is? Point A is going to be two CMs above your flange and then two CMs over. And like I said, it is where your uterine artery crosses the ureter. And then point B is three CMs from point A laterally. And this is what your pelvic wall is going to get or what your nodal dose is basically, right? So in a AP film, you can really look, do your point A's and your point B's, but you can't really do anything else. So you always do a lateral. So here's the lateral. So the AP is where you get your point A dose and your point B dose, but the lateral is where you get your rectal dose and your bladder dose, right? So it's important, and I think, and I, I try to explain this to everybody, but it is important, what is your rectal point? Your rectal point is going to be at the midpoint of your ovoids and then five millimeters posterior. So it's five millimeters posterior to your ovoids or five millimeters posterior to your packing. Okay, so in this case, as you can see in this film, here's your ovoids, and we did have some posterior packing. So the rectal point is five millimeters from that rectal packing. So here's my rectal point. And it's really, I think, important that when you are doing film based, you know, to do your rectal point, but we've actually looked at CT correlation to rectal point, and actually that's a very accurate point. So your rectal point is equal to what you probably get when you do DVHs as well. So rectal point is actually a really good point, even with films. So what is your bladder point? Your bladder point is going to be you put seven cc's in your Foley bulb, and it's the midpoint of that. Okay, and so that is your bladder point. And this is an actually a so we have looked, again, looked at data, looking at CT images, and the bladder point probably is not as accurate, film versus CT, but it's still a good point because that's what you can do with film. So what is it that you're looking at? So your reference is your point A, you should get to 87, 85 or above, right? Bladder, seven, it's really 80, so I, do, I need to fix this. So it's 80 plus or minus 10 right? Rectum is 70 plus or minus 10, and the vaginal surface dose is 100, really, plus or minus 15. Okay, so that's, those are the things that I, I need to, and I, I, I do this every time, but the bladder is wrong, it's, it really is 80, so you can go up to 90 to the bladder point. So let's talk about where we're moving to, and I think some of you guys are already doing that, and some of you guys aren't, but image-based brachytherapy, right? What is the advantage of image-based brachytherapy? One, the advantage is that it defines the disease, right? So you can actually see it. But key is, is you, you can see the normal tissues, right? So you can see the bladder, you can see the rectum. And now, because we're doing image-based brachytherapy, we're actually getting sigmoid doses too, right? Which we were not before. And you can also shape the distribution to actually true anatomical structures instead of points. So that is really the big advantage of image-based brachytherapy. So what modalities do, can you use? You can use ultrasound, you can use CT, and, or you can use MRI. And so when you're doing image-based brachytherapy, what are your definitions? So there's now new definitions. So now we don't do point A, right? So there's new definitions. One is the GTV. 
the GTV, as we all know, is the gross tumor volume. You can only contour the GTV if you have MRI. Okay, so if you do not, if you're not using MRI, you cannot contour GTV. Okay, so if you're only using CT or ultrasound to help contour, then you're going to do the high risk CTV. So what is the high risk CTV? The high risk CTV is going to be your entire cervix and what you feel at the time of brachytherapy. And that's important. So it's not your initial exam, but it's the exam at the time of brachytherapy. So if you had a 6 cm cervix at initially, but yeah. it's responded to your external beam, right? So at the time of brachytherapy, you only feel 3 cm, then that's what you're going to do. That's your high-risk CTV. So it's what is left at the time of brachytherapy. And I think that's really relevant to remember. Okay, and then you have your intermediate risk CTV, which is now basically your point A, and it's actually become an important, important dose as well. So here's just an example, right? So this is on an MRI, right? So here's your GTV, because this is your Brighton signal on the MRI. So, but like I said, the GTV can only be contoured on the MRI, and we really aren't looking at dose to the GTV anyway. So it's, it's nice to draw it or, or contour it, but it's not really relevant to dosing. Then you have your high-risk CTV, which is an orange right here. The high-risk CTV, which is what I, exactly what I said, was your cervix and what you feel at the time of brachy. So if you have vaginal involvement, you're going to contour that as your high-risk CTV. So if you still have vaginal involvement at the time of brachy therapy, then you're going to put that down. And then your intermediate-risk CTV, which is just some parameters around your high-risk CTV, which is in yellow. So we have lots of data that really does show that image-based brachytherapy improves overall survival, local control, disease-free survival, and it decreases toxicity. So as you can see, even CT-based, image-based brachytherapy improves all parameters. And this is just an old study that looked at MRI-based brachytherapy and found that image-based brachytherapy with needles actually reduced public recurrence, reduced public recurrences and actually improved toxicity. And with image-based brachytherapy, we have new constraints. And I think this is the most relevant slide that I can show you, right? So the new constraints are for the HRCTV, you wanna get between 85 and 95. But it's also important to know that you still want to document your point A, okay? So we still document your point A. And in fact, Embrace data says you should document your point A. And your point A, depending on stage, should be really 70 or above, okay? So you're not totally ignoring your point A. But you're, also, but you're aiming to dose your HRCTV. And that really varies between 80 to 90 to 95, depending on what stage you are, right? What the, uh, the stage of the patient is. Then IRCTV is also relevant, and it is D90 greater than 70 to 80, okay? And that also is dependent on stage and response. Bladder D2CCs should be less than 90, right? So that's why we said that's the same thing as what our point dose to bladder is. And in fact, though, there is actually new data saying that you really like to keep your bladder less than 80 to decrease de to decrease grade 2 toxicity, okay? Key is rectum. So you look at the rectal toxicity, right? This is all from Embrace data, which is all based on image-guided brachytherapy. The rectum D2CCs should really be less than 65 if you want to reduce grade 1 and 2 toxicities less than 75 to reduce grade three or higher, right? So really your goal is to try to get it between right, right around 70. I mean, I'm gonna tell you for us to get it less than 65 is really rare. So we aim to get less than 70. That's what our aim is, but embrace this if you can get the lower you get, which we all know the better you are. Key is this, right? For when we did image-based brachytherapy, we weren't looking at the sigmoid. I mean, I'm sorry, when we did film-based brachytherapy, we were not looking at the sig sigmoid. Now with image-based brachytherapy, we are looking at the sigmoid. And that also should be less than 75, okay? So this is new. 
since we have started doing image-based brachytherapy, we're looking at sigmoid and we're looking at small bowel. So you can see small bowel D2C2 should be less than 65. And there's a lot of ways we could talk about how to reduce small bowel doses. And we can talk about that in a bit if you guys wanna talk about it when I'm done with my talk. And then we are now looking at vaginal dose, which we already talked about, right? When we did image, I mean, when we did uh, film base, we were already looking at vagina, but then we started doing image base and we forgot about the vagina. And we found out there was lots of toxicity to the vagina. So actually the vagina is also a very important structure that needs to be looked at and you do need to get dosing for that. Okay, and you can see it's really your rectal vaginal point should be less than 70 to 75, or, or if you are contouring the vagina, the D2CCs should be less than 110. Okay, I'm going to put the chat up. So please, like I said, please feel free to ask questions, and I'm going to leave my chat up there. But any questions about film base or constraints before I end this and start doing my contouring at all? Okay, boy, people are quiet. It's evening in, in Africa, so we're ready to go have dinner and go to bed, huh? And it's the last session I heard. Okay, so let's talk about contour. And uh, so we're going to talk about contouring. We use the Electa machine. So we are using Electa, so we use Oncentra. If you have Varian, you're going to use Varian, right? And you're going to use Eclipse, I think, to do your brachytherapy. So just there's going to be difference in brachytherapy symptoms, systems that you use to contour. A lot of people contour on MIM and, and then do the planning on Oncentra or the Varian um, planning system. So you, you can use a lot of different ways to contour. We contour on Oncentra, which I'm not, it's a little bit harder to contour, I think. I do know a lot of people who contour on MIM and then transfer the contours onto Oncentra and plan. So this is a patient with cervix cancer. And, and basically, so at Anderson, we actually do CTs only. We will do an MRI on the fourth week of treatment prior to brachytherapy, and we use that as a reference. But again, we have a hard time getting MRIs for our patients because the insurance does not pay for it. A lot of people will do an MRI once for the five HDRs, so they'll either do it with the first brachytherapy or with the second brachytherapy. Um, I'm gonna show you how to control on a CT because that's what we do. I know we were supposed to do an MRI and I can happy do that for another time if we want to, because I couldn't get an MRI that was anonymized, so I do apologize, but I will be happy to do an MRI contouring session another time if we want to do that. But let's talk about CT, which is I think the most common and what's used really more frequently in most places just because it's easier to get, right? So here's your axial, here's your sagittal, and here's your coronal. And you want to have all three of these images up when you're going to contour, and that's important. So a couple of things that I do before we before we do anything, right? And I again, I either you can have your physicist or your dosimetrist, whoever is helping you do it, is key is you want to go ahead and measure. So a normal cervix is about three cm's in length, okay? And that really should be unless there's large amount of endocervical disease left at your MRI, a normal cervix lengthwise is going to be about three cm's. Okay, so you want to go ahead and measure that and have that on your skin, on your planning thing so that you know really how much you're going to go into the uterus, right? So it's about 3 cm, so I always put that in first. That's nice, close. So that's going to be my 3 cm mark. So that's going to be how far I'm going to go into my uterus unless I have endocervical involvement or I have myometrial involvement on my based on my MRI. Okay, so this is a lady with stage 2b cancer who had complete response on MRI. Okay, so and on exam, I did not feel anything on the parametrium at the time of my brachytherapy. So the other thing that is really important before you start contouring, when you if you have an MRI, that's great on your fourth week or your fifth week. The other is on your exam. So in this case, the cervix itself is about 3 cm in width. And as I said, we already know that the length is about 3 cm because she did not have endocervical lesion, right? So then the other thing that you want to do is you want to make, you want to 
you know, right before your cervixes, you can also measure out three CMs because that's what I said was, right, is three CMs in width on my exam. So I'm going to go ahead and measure that. And a lot of times I'll do it after I contour, but you can do it maybe. Let me see if I can do this. <laughs> Here we go. So you can also measure it this way, 3 cm. So that helps, right? So about 3 cm is actually, that's about 4 cm. So in this, in the CT, which always over contours is about 4 cm. Okay, so you're going to start off with those kinds of rules. So where do you start when you contour? And I'm going to show you some things that we do. And again, ask questions. So I usually start, you can, you can start wherever you want to start. but And you can also start in different ways, right? You can start with your HRC TV, or you can start with your normal tissues, or you can start with however you want, okay? That it really is your decision. I'm gonna show you how to contour the HRC TV. And then what we can do is we can talk about how to contour your normal tissues as well. Maybe I'm gonna show you how to contour your, my HRC TV. Okay, so, like I said, I contour on the axial, but you want to look at your sagittal and you want to look at your coronal. We always put markers at the six o'clock and the nine o'clock position. I'm sorry, six o'clock and 12 o'clock position of our cervix. Okay. So you, as you can see in this, but you don't have to do that either. But we do. So I'm just going to show you what we have on here. So this patient has um, marker. So this is a platinum marker. You can see that's my posterior marker. And my anterior marker is, if I pass it right there. Okay, so that's my anterior marker right here. That's my seat right there. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to see, and you can start wherever. I'm going to start in the middle, and then I'm going to come back up and down. Okay, so this is my tandem right here, right? So I'm going to contour my HRCT, which is going to be my cervix and whatever I felt at the time of brachytherapy. Okay, so right there, and that's my tandem. And then I'm going to go up. Here's my seed, right? So this is going to be my HRCTV. And I'm going to go down a little. And, and as you can see, these are my ovoids. So you know your cervix is not going to be inferior to your ovoids. So you're going to go right above. And I have my seed right there. So I know that it went up here. So that's going to be my HRCTV. And I'm going to go down. And I'm going to right to my ovoids and probably right here. Right? And then, and if you look at your sagittal, now you're right at the flange. I think that's where my cervix stopped, right? So then you're going to keep going up. And you're going to contour, and I'm going to keep up, keep because it will. And there, so you can see this is my posterior seed right here. So I know my cervix goes there, and I'm going to. We have a quick question in the chat um, uh -huh. from just a second ago when you put in those markers, and they want Evans wants to know how you put in those two markers. Yeah, so we have seed inserters, and that's how we put the markers in. And they're, I mean, those are commercially available nowadays. They actually have MRI compatible markers that are easy to use so you can use those you know it's I think markers are really important when you're doing film base right because you really need to know you're up against the cervix I think if you're doing image based brachytherapy you don't need to use markers as much in this case we did but nowadays when we're, we're really doing HDR and we're just doing CT immediately we don't always use the markers okay thank you so as you go up, you're going to see this is going to be, this is your uterus, right? So this is going to be your cervix. Again, the nice thing is I do have the markers, but you don't, like I said, you don't have to have the markers when you're doing image base. And as you go up, you're going to, you don't want to contour the uterus because there was no endocervical involvement, right? Now you can see that I'm doing this ad hoc, but that's where also that 3CM is important. So you know how far up you're going to go in your uterus. So you can see I'm going, I have my 3CM. So again, a little bit here, right? And I'm probably right around a little bit down here. And we probably could go a little bit more anterior. But you want to look and see how your sagittal looks and what everything looks like, right? And I think we're getting near the end. So this is going to be the last of my, probably my 3CMs. And... I think this is it, right? Okay, so now I'm going to look at my sagittal, probably the last one. OK, 
okay i probably did a little bit higher than but you, you that's why you have the three cms right yeah it's way this is my three cms ends right there right so now you're going to look at your sagittal and say well you know what maybe i need to go a little bit more anterior make sure i cover that right because i don't have enough anterior so you look at the sagittal right there and say yeah maybe i need to go just a little bit more anterior to make sure i cover all that tandem yeah it's probably a little bit too tight anteriorly and that's why I said this is why it's important to have your sagittal as well as your coronal when you're doing this. So you're looking at this. And I probably am probably too tight anteriorly, period. Okay. So now let's see. So now you want to scroll in and out of your sagittal and look. And that looks pretty good. If you look at my sagittal, I probably could go a little bit more anterior. I think there's one slice I went too anterior, right? But you can see. That's not bad. So that's about three CMs up and that's actually a pretty decent. Yeah, no, actually I'm not probably, I'm not, yeah, you can say it's about one and a half CMs around the tandem, right? Let's see, let's measure. That's a good point. Good question, right? We can measure, let's measure. Good question. I'm not sure exactly if that is probably, but you, I, you know, you do look at the structures, right? So here's a tandem. Let's see. Yeah, it's about two and a half posterior. So, I mean, that's why you have to, but uh, yeah, probably about one and a half to two CMs around the tandem. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But you do want to look, because you want to see if that's where the sagittal helps, because you can really see the sagittal. I don't know if you guys want me to, uh, hold on, I have to stop measuring. Let's zoom up on the sagittal. Um, so there you go. So you, you, I think what I'm actually missing some anteriorly. So I definitely think I need to contour a little bit more anterior, but that was where that marker helped. But I think I definitely do need, if you look, I probably do need to contour more anteriorly. And actually this patient was already contoured. So you can see, <laughs> I probably, so this is the, the contour that we originally did. So yeah, I do probably, I probably was a little shy anteriorly. So you probably do need to contour just a little bit more anteriorly. Okay, do you see that? So I definitely, I'm probably a little bit shy anteriorly. So I would, I need to extend my contours a little bit more anteriorly. And that's why you want to look at your sagittal and say, yeah, look, I am missing this, this part just a little bit anteriorly, right? So that's what you would add. So the other thing that helps, and like I said, the way I do it, and I'm going to be honest with you guys, I do contour my normal tissues first because that will help, especially your bladder. So just... Just, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time contouring the bladder because that's going to take you guys, but let's look at the, so we already have a bladder contour. So let's look at the bladder contour because those, let's look at, because I, you know, we could spend a lot of time contouring, but let's look at this bladder contour that I already have. And that does help you know where the anterior part should go, but here's your bladder contour, right? And you do really want to contour the, your entire bladder, right? Right there. And that's important to get that bladder contour in. So I, and I'll be honest, and I did start with the HRCTB, but I normally actually start with my normal tissues because that's important. And then I come back and contour the HRCTB, okay? So if you look at the bladder contour and you wanna get all the bladder, right? So as you can see, we start from the, this probably is a little bit too low. You don't need to get this low. So, but you want to make sure that you have the bladder, con most all the bladder contoured because you're going to get a D2CCs. Now we have the Foley bulb and we have a little bit of contrast in the Foley bulb, which helps us. You don't always, in fact, we're not using contrast at all anymore because you can't get contrast because we have a shortage in the United States of contrast. So, but you can still see the Foley bulb, but you can see how we contour the bladder and that is really important and it does help you identify what the anterior part of your HRCTV is. So I, you know, my HRCTV, I have to be honest, I was probably a little bit shy anteriorly and probably do need to make it bigger like we did originally, right? And that's where your normal tissue does help. Yeah, so I was just a little bit shy anteriorly. So we have a couple questions coming in in the chat. One from a few minutes ago. Is it okay if I ask that really quick? Please. Okay, they ask, Med asks, if we have a case in which upper vaginal should irradiate with five grade and lower vaginal should irradiate with four grade, we can use a cylinder applicator. How could we do this plan? So I'm sorry, ask that question. Where did I miss it here? Okay, here we sure. go. Sure, it's a little look. bit yeah, higher up. Yeah, oh, so exactly, that, exact, exactly that same way. So the good question. So we use tandem and cylinders, right? And so what you don't, so in, when we do a tandem, and I don't have a tandem and cylinder in here, which I should have because we had a case of a tandem and cylinder. So you want to contour that and, but you're going to do this to the surface, right? So you're going to do the upper cylinder at five gray, and then you do the second cylinder at four gray. 
I mean, it's just you reduce the dose to the second cylinder. Does that make sense? Yes. And then, um, how many cc's? If you have any follow up questions, yeah, feel free yeah, to ask. Yeah, please just keep ask. Yeah, so how many cc's of water do you use? Okay, good question. Okay, that's actually a really relevant question. Okay, bladder filling is important. It's what most people recommend. And again, my, this bladder is empty, right? Most people recommend starting with 200 cc's, right? And the, what, why do you want to fill the bladder? The advantage of you filling the bladder is that you can push the bowel, the small bowel out of the way, right? And in this case, let's, let's unzoom this. Oh, that's, I mean, that's actually a really good question. I'm gonna unzoom it, maybe, okay. So if you see here's, so fortunately for me, I didn't really have a lot of bowel in this case, right? And if you, and I'm gonna show you how this plan worked, but I didn't have a whole lot of bowel in this case, but the recommendation is to start with 200 cc's and see what it looks like. And if the 200 cc's really does push the bowel away, then you're good. So what a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, sometimes I'll do, I'll do, if I'm doing HDR, right? And it, depending on how many fractions, some fractions I'll do empty and some fractions I'll do full because that changes where my bladder and my rectum and, and my sigmoid and small bowel are. But the recommendation usually is to start with 200 cc's and see what it looks like and then decide if you need more or less. And what you want to do is you want to look at the bladder dose, you want to look at the rectal dose, you want to look at the sigmoid dose, and you want to look at your bowel dose. So, but that is what most people do. So the next question is, you, we usually have stage three to four disease that extends superiorly. How superior do you go in those cases? Superiorly into the uterus. So you, you're going to, your HRCTB is going to be however much disease you have in the uterus, right? So if you have disease that's going in further than the three CMs, then you're going to contour your HRCTB to go further than the three CMs, right? In this case that I had, I did not have disease that was going, you know, into the uterus, so I didn't contour it. But if you got disease going into the uterus, that's going to be your HRCTB, and you're going to have to plan it for that dose. Does that make sense? So, like, if I have an inoperable endometrium, I'm going to contour the entire uterus, right? And I'm going to treat the entire uterus, and that's going to have to get the full dose. Again, great questions, and you guys, please just uh, unmute and ask. So let's just, like I said, I'm not going to sit down, <laughs> since I'm doing a terrible job of contouring in front of you, we're going to just show you the contours I had. But no, I actually didn't do that bad, but I may have done a little bit better. But I, internally, I think I skipped. But let's look at our rectum, right? So the rectum is going to be, again, really important. And I'm just going to scroll in and out because I already had the rectum contoured. But let's just, again, the rectal is going to be, and it's really important that you differentiate the rectum from the sigmoid, okay? Because they are two different structures, and those both structures are important. And so, again, you're going to start off from the bottom up. So, again, I think some of this you probably don't need to do, but we did went all the way. This is probably closer to the anus, but as you go up, the green is going to be your rectum. And I, if you can see the green, and I'm going to try to what I'll do is turn off everything else and let's just look at the rectum. Okay, hold on. Okay, now if you look at the rectum, here we go. So, he, so you can see where we contour the rectum as it goes up. Here's the rectum and you can see it on your sagittal. Again, it's really important to look at both the sagittal, axial, and coronal to make sure that you're contouring correctly. But as you can see, here's the rectum and then you're going to See where it goes to sigmoid, and you're going to stop contouring it when it goes to sigmoid. And if I turn my sigmoid on, there's my sigmoid, right? Okay, so if you look, and we, let's go down again. Here's my rectum, and as it goes up, there you can see where, as it's turning, it's going to be the sigmoid, and there's your sigmoid right there in blue, okay? So here's your sigmoid, and the sigmoid actually is wrapping around the uterus and the cervix and the HRC TV, as you can see, right there. See right there, it really does wrap around, but you have to contour your sigmoid. And it is important to look at both your bladder, I mean, look both sagittally and axially to make sure that you've got the sigmoid accurately contoured. So this is where your bladder filling really makes it's important, right? If I had my bladder really full in this case, I, that sigmoid would be even closer, 
because by filling my bladder, if you look at my sagittal, right, by filling my bladder, I would push, I don't know, can you see, I don't know if you can see my hand, but if I filled this bladder up more, I would have pushed this uterus and cervix posterior, and I would have had it smacked into the sigmoid. So by having my bladder empty, I actually am sparing dose to my sigmoid. So you do need to look at that to decide how full you want your bladder, but it's also, but most people do start with about 200 cc's. Questions? In other words, if I have an empty bladder, then I'll spare the sigmoid? In this case, I would. In this case, I would, right? So I think you have to look at it. In this case, I would, because if you see, if I fill this bladder up, if you looked at it right, if I fill this bladder up, I would have pushed that uterus posteriorly and I would have been smacked into the sigmoid. But so it depends. It's case by case. And that's why I tell that's why the other thing I'll say is I what I usually do is I'll do two. If I, I usually do five fractions, right? So I'll do two or three with empty bladder or and two to three with full bladder. Right, so then I have different doses to the sigmoid and the small bowel. So you, you know, so I don't always treat the same each one because then you can change the, where the dose is going. But in this case, if I had a full bladder, that sigmoid would have been right. It, my, my uterus would be right smacked into the sigmoid. So you just have to look at it. That's why this imaging is so important, and that's why you get true doses. But, and so the other thing that we did not contour on this, but that you really should contour is a small bowel. So as you can see, the small bowel really is right here, especially if you look at the sagittal. So this is all small bowel. And you can see really the small bowel comes right and touches the uterus right there. So you do need to contour the small bowel and you really do need to get dosing to the small bowel nowadays. That's important. As I showed you, that has to be less than 65 gray, right? So I, you should definitely contour this all of this bowel right here. That is by the brachytherapy so that you can get dose to that. Now, again, in this case, so let's talk about, right, the bladder filling. In this case, if I have full bladder, I may have less dose to the bowel, right? But I may have more dose to the sigmoid. And that's why you change the bladder filling that you may change on each implant. So you change the dose to certain things. Does that make sense? So, yeah. Right? That's why you have I to look. Go ahead. I also noticed that inferiorly you did not contour it a little bit inferior. You just reached at, reached at the os. My HRCTV? Yeah. No, I, so if you look, <laughs> if you look at my HRCTV, I did go inferiorly. So I'm right, see, because I had that flange and I had my C. See, here's my ovoids. I'm right at the top of my ovoids. Do you see that? Yeah. Here's my ovoids, right? Uh, so this now you go down a bit? No, because your cervix is not going to go down there, right? Your cervix is going to be right to your ovoids or your rink. Your cervix is not going to go past that, right? Okay. Right? I know. A lot of people do this. A lot of people will contour here. or con right? yeah. But I have packing. I have packing right there, right? So I know I don't have cervix there. Right? You okay. can see my packing. I know I've seen a lot of people do that where they, but is your service, even if you have a ring, the service is on top of your ring. It's not going to be in between your ring unless you have some exophytic disease that's going in, but most of the time it's going to be right at the top. I know I've seen people, unless you have vaginal involvement, then you may want to contour here, right? If you have vaginal involvement, but if you don't have vaginal involvement, then you don't, you're not going to go past your own voice. If you look at my HRCTV, it goes right to my ovoids because that's where my cervix is. Does that make sense? I've seen that. I agree. You, uh, and I don't know why you, because your cervix anatomically won't go past that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. But does it also depend on the stage of the disease? Right. But remember, you're going to, con your HRCTV is going to be what you feel at the time of brachytherapy. So if okay. you do have vaginal vomit, then you're going to contour the vagina. Right. So then then an ovoid may not be the right answer. Maybe a ring would be the right answer or a cylinder. Right. And then you will control. But it is not. So remember that the HRCTV and that's why I'm emphasizing it. The HRCTV is what you feel at the time of brachytherapy, not what okay. your original disease was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I get I get you. OK. <laughs> that, I mean, that's important. So if you still feel perimetrial involvement, then you need to know 
HRCTV is at the time of brachytherapy, not your original disease. Ah, that's why you're coming to see me, right? No, that's why you're going to come to see me, and all you're going to do is contour HRCTVs. <laughs> And I, you know what, I would love to do another session to show you the MRI, because I have a great MRI case, I just couldn't get it anonymized, so, so that we could compare that both the uh, MRI and CT, because I think that's going to be important. So the question is, who does the contouring, the oncologist or physicist, so can I just say some things about that? I have residents, so again, also, you can tell that uh, I probably don't do a I probably don't do a lot of contouring, right? No, so the physicist... I've also noticed you did not contour the vagina. And right. uh, in your previous slide, I saw you had some dose tolerance for that. Right. We don't contour the vagina. We're going to look at our rectal vaginal points as our, our, our vaginal contour, right? But a lot of people will contour the vagina. It does take time. And um, so we, we personally aren't contouring the vagina, but a lot of people are contouring the vagina. We will look at our RV points. So we do look at our vaginal, we get we get point doses to the vagina. So we do get doses to the vagina. We just don't contour it. Again, it, it's, 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 you know, how much time you have. And contouring the vagina takes a lot of time. So we will get point doses instead of doing the two CCs. So we will do okay. the RV points. Okay. okay. And then the big question is who, who does the contouring? The contouring, so, the, so in most places, the physicists will do all the normal tissues. And the physician will do the HRCTV and review the normal tissues. So that is a no normal practice in most places to get things going is the, um, is it that physicists will do the normal tissues, the physician will do the HRCTV and review the normal tissues. Okay, so there's a hand raised, go ahead. Thank you, Mark. So what happens, in the in the situation that there's no disease at the time of brachytherapy, so what do you control? What are you treating? The cervix. That's where you do exactly what the cervix, just just the cervix, and that's where you know your HRCTV doses may be really high because your cervix could be only two cm's in size. So all you contour, if there's no disease left, you're going to contour the entire cervix because that's what the HRCTV is, right? The cervix plus whatever disease you feel at the time of brachytherapy. Okay. Another one, in a patient that's done THBSO and there's no disease left, what am I going to use to treat? Cylinder, am I justified? So it's so somebody who's had a radical hysterectomy? Yes. And then yeah. at the time of brachytherapy, post external beam, there's no disease felt. So what am I going to treat? Okay, I, I, so I'm sorry. So the patients that had a radical hysterectomy, you did external beam? Yeah. And then you do, you do vaginal cuff. You just use cylinders. Only cylinder. Yeah. And I before the external beam, there's no disease extension. So there's no extension to the vagina. Am I still justified to use the cylinder? Yes. Okay. And in a case that you have somebody else that's also done THBSO, at the time of brachytherapy, as like a 2 3 cm disease. In that case, I chose to do, to come down using high MRT, would that not be better than using, because I was told that I, I guess cylinder will not give me a good judgment to come yes. down and then leave brachytherapy totally. Ask me that question again. A patient that had radical after the 45 or 50 gray, the disease left is about 2 cm. So in that case, I decided to cone down instead of doing brachytherapy with cylinder. Right. Well, you couldn't treat it with cylinder. You would have to do interstitial. We don't right. have interstitial. Yes. Right. <laughs> then, then you do external beam. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so, you, so, so that's so you know that's it. That's important to know, right? I mean, a couple of things I haven't. We and again, you know, it'd be great to do another session. And I know you guys are ex exhausted, but you know, so a couple of things to know, which we're not even talking about here, right? Is that needles yeah. are being used more and more, right? And in fact, embrace two seventy percent of the cases have needles now. So they're using needles with the tandem and ovoid or tandem and rings. And there are really cases that have shown that needles plus intercavitary is probably better than intercavitary alone for certain stages, right? Or certain diseases. 
So in, in fact, EMBRACE 2, the protocol recommends that at least 30% of the patients have a combination of needles and, tana, and, and intercavitary, okay? And in fact, what they did find though in EMBRACE 2 was 70% of them had a combination of intercavitary and interstitial. But the question is, what can a cylinder treat? A cylinder cannot treat anything more than five millimeters or less disease. So if you have anything that's thicker than five millimeters, a cylinder is not gonna treat it. And then you have to either use needles, or if you don't have needles, then you have to do external beam, okay? So if you have something that's thicker than five millimeters, a cylinder is not gonna touch it at all. And that's yeah, really tandem and, tandem and cylinder. Yeah. Okay. So the two that we use tandem and cylinders all the time. One, if you can't get a ring or ovoids in, right, then you use a tandem and cylinder. So if somebody's very narrow, then you use a tandem and cylinder. If you cannot get minis or, or, or a ring up, because you've got to get it up against the cervix. And I have seen that, you know, where people will just put ovoids in and you're not anywhere near the cervix. Then because it was too narrow. So then you have to use a tandem and cylinder. The other times that you're gonna use a tandem and cylinder if there va was vaginal involvement, right? So if you have upper one third of the vagina involved, then you may wanna do two or three cases. You know, if you're doing five fractions, you may wanna do two with a tandem and ovoids and three with a cylinder, just so you can get some dose to the vagina. Right? Yeah, that's it, thank you. Okay. Those were all good questions, and I think that goes with that. Can, can you still can you still uh, achieve that by just using tandem and the ring, but you extend the ring past to the ring down when it's going down? Is it possible? So they highly recommend you not doing that. Why? Be well, one because you, because then it's really high. So advantage of using that cylinder is that it pushes the vagina out. Right? Yeah. And then you're only treating the vagina so there's not a hot, hot dose in the middle. Okay. So it's highly recommended that you do not just load the stem. But that's the advantage of a ring over ovoids is if you do have anterior vaginal involvement, right, right by the cervix, you can load that anterior part of the ring, right? So that does help. But it's only going to treat up to where that ring is, right? But lower than that, you're not supposed to load that. You, they highly recommend because it's just too hot and you're going to get necrosis. That's where okay. the cylinder helps. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, great question. Very good question. And I just wanted to show you, and I know we're running out of time, and again, it'd be great on the last session, but it just, would be great. Just, a, just one more question. Yeah. When you are using the interstitial, yeah. does it like, uh, do you remove it every time after the patient? Sorry, I've not uh, used that much. I don't have much experience. You, yeah, you, have this, uh, you have this ring with some interstitial holes huh, where you put in. Is it, does it stay there? Or the patient stay in the ward or you, you remove it every time and uh, every fraction? So there's two ways to do it. The way a lot of people do it is that they will do BID fractionation, right? Or, or th so they'll do one and then do one the next day, and then they take it out and then have them come back in two weeks and repeat it. And so they'll do four fractions. A lot of people will just do it. They just put it in every time. So there's a lot of ways to do it. Now, if you're doing a SIA template, then that they keep the patient in and they do it twice a day for five uh, for five fractions. Okay, so a side template, you're going to keep it in. You do not take it in now. But yes, for a ring with in needles, either you can do, you know, it BID that same day or one that day and the one the next day, take it out and have the patient come back two weeks later or you take it out every time. Okay, okay, okay. How is it there's no doing one today or... And and there's the no difference. There's no, there's no advantage. The advantage is that you don't have to do needles, you know, poke needles in every time, right? So then yeah. you're only poking it. Yeah. But radiobiologically, there's no difference. So you can do it however you want. A lot of, I mean, I'm going to tell you, with the 70% embrace, you know, data, you know, they're putting it in. The, the, what a lot of people will do is they do the first implant without the needle. 
and see if they need needles or not, and then put the needles in for the second and third implant, and maybe not for the fourth implant, right? Okay. So they may not use needles for every one of them. And then I Thank just wanted you. to show a plan, the plan of this patient with everything in it. And you can see, I probably nowadays, I probably wouldn't load the tip as hot as this one is because I bet that bowel dose is hotter than I would like it to be. But as you can see, here's the top of the uterus. So the bowel is really not getting much of anything because this, this is about 50%. But, you know, again, the sigmoid though, as you can see, the sigmoid really is coming into my 100% uh, line. So I bet the sigmoid is probably a little bit hotter than I would like. So I would have probably, I would probably decrease this a little bit um, on the top just to reduce the dose to the sigmoid and the rectum. But I bet the sigmoid would be my biggest issue. And if you can look right here on your sagittal, you can see where the sigmoid really comes right into. See that right there? So it would be interesting to see what that sigmoid dose is. And I would probably I would probably cool this plane off a little bit just because I bet my sigmoid is really hot in that case.